Welcome to BFF with the Chef. I'm your host, Nicole Schweigman. Aloha, friends and foodies, and welcome back. Today, I'm interviewing Chef Ryan Peters, a former restaurant owner and now the current sous chef at Fish Nor Fowl, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Born and raised in Reading, Pennsylvania, Ryan has always had a passion for the culinary arts. After graduating from culinary school, he moved to Florida to begin his career. After short stints in both Florida and Pittsburgh, working under chefs such as Chef Kevin Sousa at the former Salt of the Earth in Pittsburgh, Ryan opened his own restaurant instead of a Pittsburgh food hall. Ryan has also stodged at some of the best restaurants around the country to include one month at the famed French Laundry in Yachtville, California. Despite all of those amazing learning experiences, Ryan believes that opening a restaurant was one of the best he had because it taught him how to run a business and see the big picture. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Okay, so actually, should I call you Chef Ryan, Chef Peters, Ryan? Ryan is totally fine. All right. I was going to call you your cookness. That was the one I was leaning toward. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, all right, we're getting started already. (laughs) Well, cool. You never know. Like, I don't, I don't want to be like offending you. No, I got a, I got a real, I got a, I got another real live chef. Whenever I get a chef on, I'm like, Ooh, I don't want (laughs) to. All right. Well, I'm super excited to chat with you. I know I'm about to learn some super chefy stuff as we are all. And so um, that's just the kind of thing we love here at BFF the Chef. So let's get into it. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Tell me about the last meal you cooked for yourself. The uh, last meal I cooked for myself was probably pasta bolognese at home. Uh, it's kind of my go-to meal that I cook for myself and my wife at home just because it's so easy and it's our favorite and can be done pretty easy and we can have it in the freezer. And so that's probably the last one at home. Oh, that's so nice. So you, so you're, so in other words, you pre-make sauces and just pull them out whenever you're, you're ready. Yeah. It's so easy. Oh my goodness. That sounds amazing. Can you, do you have a special like Bloganese uh, sauce recipe? I do. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Cause that sounds good. Like I'm not letting you go until you tell me a little bit about it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's, it. <laughs> it's really simple. I mean, it's just, you know, a few vegetables. I do some onions, some shallots, some garlic, some carrots, um, cut them up super, super fine and kind of let them confit in some olive oil in my sauce pot, add some crushed canned tomatoes, some veal and pork and beef that I browned off and let that cook for just, you know, three or four hours, super low, season it. And then we, we let it cool and we just, we'll, we're lucky enough at the house, we have a cryovac machine so we can cryovac it and freeze it. And then, you know, whenever we want dinner at home, since we both work so much, pull it out and it's ready to go. Okay. Three things. A cryovac machine? Yeah. Ooh, what is a cryo... Wait, so you mean like a cold vacuum yeah, sealer? Yeah, so just a vacuum sealer. Like kind of like like a food saver. But since, you know, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get into it. when Since when I had my restaurant, I bought like a commercial uh, vacuum sealer. So now it just lives at my house. So I'm spoiled and get to use it. There are three people right now going, I need that. I want to get it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just randomly threw that out there. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, that's a chef for you. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so for the record, you're not saying you can't have good blogginase if you don't have a cr- No, 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 absolutely not. I'm just get get a little advantage. I love it. Okay. All right. What's a meal that brings you back to your childhood? You know, the, I was fortunate enough that, you know, my mom cooked a lot for us as a kid. One that kind of always comes to mind, it was just so simple, uh, was just her making uh, chicken parmesan. Kind of grew up in not a crazy Italian household, but my grandparents are Italian. So obviously my mom got that influence and, you know, she knew chicken parm was our favorite. So whenever it was chicken parm night, that was always, uh, was always a good night. That sounds really delicious. And shout out to all the moms who cook dinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Okay. And give us an ingredient you can't live without. Uh, Lemons. Easy. Lemons. You're the second person who said oh, yeah. lemon. Tell us why. I think that, mm-hmm. you know, lemons are, are just a really good way. They're, you know, uh, one of the chefs that I really look up to, Chef Keller, it's kind of something that he talks about a lot. And I've taken away from him is, you know, using lemons and using acid as a as a seasoning ingredient, just as you would with salt. Uh, it really brings out flavors and, and enhances flavors. Uh, I mean, you can just... I, I add lemon to so many things and it really just brightens up a dish and, and makes a big difference. Wow. That's a great tip. Yeah. Emmeline Shimperid, uh, she just actually, 
I just interviewed her um, a couple of weeks ago and she, she's a food blogger, but she said the same thing, not exactly in the same way, but she talked about, she can't live without lemons yeah, or limes. So important. Yeah. She loves butter, but she will add lemon, you know, to anything that's real buttery because she's like, it just, it just cuts right through. Yeah, exactly. And Emily Wilson has said the same thing about acid. So I hear over and over the use of acid just is so important to making your meals more delicious. So that's a really cool, that's, that's the second time I've heard that, but that's probably one of the better ingredients I've heard that people don't really think about. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's such an easy thing too. You know, it's not like this expensive ingredient or this, you know, luxury ingredient that you need to spend a lot of money. It's just, it's a lemon. It's so easy. You can pick it up at a market and it just, it really can take a dish from, from good to great. It's just like that. Wow. Okay. I'm definitely going to start trying to put more lemon in my food. Or I mean, any, any citrus for that matter. I mean, limes or oranges or, or tangerines or yuzu or I mean, anything. It just, it's, it's really, really uh, versatile. It's great. All right, man. That's a great tip. You're giving tips already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get into it. Okay. Cool. So I know you said uh, that you always kind of wanted to be in the culinary world. So let's start, let's go back to young Ryan, right? You're, you're starting your child, not too long. Don't go to a baby. No, no baby. <laughs> there's no two year olds. Like I want to cook. Yeah. <laughs> if there are, you need to get that kid on top chef. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so take, take us back to the moment where you, before you wanted to cook, when you decided, yep, this is what I want to do. And then lead us from there. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, some people have that moment where it was just like it clicked and you know, I want to be a chef when I grew up. For me, it was kind of, I don't have that moment where I remember realizing that's what I wanted to do. For me, it's kind of just always been what I wanted to do. You know, and my mom still has the pictures of that I would draw in elementary school of, you know, the teachers asking what you want to be when you're older, and I would always draw a chef. And so it's something that from a very young age, it's what I wanted to do. And I've kept with that, you know, all throughout my childhood and then into my into my teenage years and, and, and beyond that. So for me, you know, just kind of, setting that goal very early and, and watching it take place has been, has been really great. But um, yeah, it's just been something that has been important to me from a very young age. Were you the person who cooked, did you cook with your mom a lot or were you in the kitchen a lot? I did, you know, for me and my mom likes to tell a lot of people, uh, which can get embarrassing, but I, uh, I was the kid that I would like to play restaurant at home. So I would, I would kick everybody out of the kitchen and I would, you know, prepare a meal and I would have them, they would have to knock on the closet door and I would take their name and like I was a host and I would seat them. And so, I mean, it was fun. It was just something that, you know, I got into very young and and I've stuck with it. That is so adorable. I can just see you now going, excuse me, we have no tables right now. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, like, you know, my mom would order from the menu that I wrote and Unfortunately, I would have to tell her that everything was sold out except for the one thing that I actually did prepare. And <laughs> so it's funny. And she's like, okay, I'll, I'll have the lamb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What a great mom. I lo- First of all, I call my mom my OG cheerleader. She's like my, you know, the original cheerleader yeah. uh, uh, in my life. Like you're, it's always your, your mom or your dad. But for me, especially my mom who... I mean, I, she just, she allowed me when I was, my, my culinary bug hit when I was 13. That was when I was like, I, I need to cook for myself and for my family. There's a story I always tell about how I, there's summer of Little Caesars pizza. Little Caesars is going to be like, take at me one day. Let me tell you, <laughs> Little Caesars pizza, it's good. Okay. But I spent the summer eating it as my mom worked. She's a nurse and she worked like double shifts to take care of me. And in my, all of my teenage, you know, angsty glory, I was like, I'm tired of eating this. I would eat some vegetables. Cause you know, in the nineties, y'all, you could feed your kids pizza every day and nobody judged you. Now, like, you'd be in jail. But, you know, then you could feed them a diet of hot pockets and, you know, <laughs> and, and she, it wasn't always like that, but that summer, you know, she, we were on our own and she was just working to just survive. So, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. But I declared to her that I wanted to to learn to cook because I, I want to eat vegetables. And you know what? Uh, she was like and this bratty 13-year-old. So she's like, go learn to cook. And I did. And I got a Betty Crocker cookbook and I made the worst meatloaf and mashed potatoes. <laughs> oh, my God. Like to this day, it's still the worst meal I ever made, and she ate it. Yes. And she just poured a ton of ketchup on it. <laughs> yeah, and so that awakened something within me that was like, oh, I this is something that 
feels good sure. to to make you know, meals for her. So that's how I got started in wanting to learn to cook. But I love that, you know, your mom is there just like playing along, encouraging and nurturing this gift and, and this love of the culinary world inside of yeah. you. So shout out to your mom Absolutely. for being awesome. Yeah. And for being your OG cheerleader. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. You say, yep, you know, we're out of everything but the land mom. And also I want to go to culinary school. What made you, I mean, obviously you want it to be a chef, but there's this big debate that goes on. Like, should you go? Should you not go? Why did you decide to go to culinary school? Well, you know, I think that debate is definitely out there and is talked about a lot. And for me, I just, I, I felt that I needed that, uh, that structure and that, that, that base of knowledge um, as a as a starting ground. So you know, I, I did decide to go to culinary school. Um, I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania. They have a so IUP. It's a it's a state college, and they have a very small, very very small culinary campus uh, in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, home of uh, the infamous Groundhog Day. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a like an extremely small town dedicated to this groundhog. It was a very interesting experience. Um, but so, yeah, I went to culinary school there and they have a, a very small culinary campus. Like I said, it's only about 100 students they take. It's only a one year program, but it's year round. So you go you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five every day, August to August. So it's very just kind of intense and rigorous kind of to get you in and out and then get you right out into the industry. Uh, which for me, that's kind of what I was looking for out of culinary school was to get the basics and uh, the structure that I needed. Because to me, that's my opinions on culinary school. I, you know, I think that I have a lot of friends that have gone to culinary school and done great things, and a lot of friends that I have not gone to culinary school and have still done great things. So I think that it's not for everybody. But at the end of the day, I think out of culinary school, you get what you put into it. And at the same time, there's only so much you can get out of it. I think that culinary school is good for the basics. Uh, but beyond that, I think that really just immersing yourself into the industry is the best way to learn. Okay, that's really great to hear that. I like that you, you know, the thing that I take away from what you're saying is that it's a great foundation. So if you feel like you need that foundation, especially you probably were coming out of high school and like, you know, I'm going straight into doing this. This gave you that foundation to, to get started. What are your thoughts about like, so there's, there's someone who's like, I'm going to follow in this guy's footsteps and, you know, they're listening and they're absorbing every day they can. Their parents are about, you know, should I become a chef? Like, okay, how do I go about doing this? So what is your advice for them? Cause I'm sure there are people telling them, you don't need to go to culinary school. And then there's some people like, you better go to culinary school. You know, what would be your advice for like one, you know, teenager who's about to enter, you know, into, into college and two, older folks, people who like, I always say like, there's a banker out there who's actually wants to be a chef or who dreamed of being a chef. And his parents are like, you'll never make any money. You're, I'm not paying for college unless you go to be a banker. Now you're a banker or a doctor or something professional. Sure. And they're like, I, and, you know, cause there's always that dream people have of, of like, um, you know, the dream of quitting your job and going to culinary school and becoming a chef. So I want to talk to first that, you know, teenager who's uh, that young adult who's, who's entering you know, into life. And then I want to talk about the older uh, person and what you think their path should be in your opinion. Okay. I mean, I think for me, that's easy. I think it's honestly the same answer for, for both scenarios. I think that I would say to, you know, get a job in a restaurant first and, you know, spend six months at a restaurant and see just to, to figure out what this life is like and what this industry is like and, and, and what it, what it means to to be on your feet cooking every day for you know twelve hours a day because uh, it's not for everyone. It's tough. It takes a lot out of you. So I think really just doing that and and understanding it would be big to understand if culinary school is the is the right path for you because you know it's a big investment you know financially and and from a time standpoint. So you you know you don't want to do that and then realize you know two years into after graduating that, uh, you know what, this isn't right for me, which can still happen. But it's good to at least have, you know, some sort of, you know, viewpoint going into it to kind of give you a little bit of an advantage to, to understand that this is right. No, that's great advice. I think people like oftentimes there's a, there's a dream of doing something and then there's a the reality of doing it. And, you know, 
I think it's also too important to, 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 to realize like, you know, before, if you, if you think that, okay, I want to get into the culinary arts, I want to get into this industry. I want to go to culinary school. Well, you need, I think it's important to take a step back and, and try and figure out what exactly it is you want to do in this industry because culinary school, you know, may not be what's needed to get to where you want to be. You know, sometimes all it takes is literally, you know, finding a chef that you want to work for and, and just going to work for that chef. So sometimes it's so much easier than going through culinary school and, and, and apprenticeships and, and things like that. Sometimes it's just kind of taking a step back and looking at yourself and what your goals are and kind of, I mean, it's tough, but just figuring it out, what steps you need to take to, to get there. Okay. So I want to talk about yeah. cooking because that's what we're here for. We want to hear, we want to hear the goods of what you're making, man. But well, actually, before we get to that, let's talk about your stodges, especially at the French Laundry, because I'm definitely excited to hear about what that was like. Uh, that is one of my dream restaurants, by the way. I, you know, there's some people who go shopping online and they get a glass of wine and they go shopping online late at night. I get uh, <laughs> a glass of wine and late at night and I go looking at restaurant menus and or I look at restaurant <laughs> web pages and the French Laundry. It's like the holy grail for me. It's one of the top three restaurants that I want to eat at before I die. And the fact that you get to, you, I didn't even know that before we were just like chatting back and forth on Instagram, but the fact that you started right. well, there. I mean, it's oh quite a story. Goodness. Please um, tell us you know, everything. So I'm going to kind of give you the back story first of, you know, what led me there. And then we can talk about that. Um, Cause I think the back story is just as important of the actual experience. Mm-hmm. So I was very fortunate enough a few years ago to get involved with the mentor BKB foundation, which, you know, a lot of people don't aren't aware of, mm-hmm. unfortunately, I think they should be. So the mentor BKB is the foundation behind Team USA for the uh, for the Boku store, uh, which the Boku store is the you know it's ultimately the Culinary Olympics. It is held every two years in Lyon, France, and it is a international interested in that. So I applied for that and got selected for that again, and uh, was able to go to the French Laundry for one month this year. And it's basically a competition that brings twenty four countries together to compete on this world stage uh, is actually going on right now as we speak today is day two of it which is very exciting so i'll be watching the awards later this evening but anyway so team usa uh chef keller and chef danielle Baloud and chef jerome bocuse uh started this foundation a few years ago to kind of build together a stronger team for team usa and part of their foundation is they do a young chef competition every year for younger chefs uh, in the states just to kind of build the, the competition spirit. So a few years ago, I was able to apply for the 2015 uh, Young Chef competition. And lo and behold, I got selected to compete in Chicago. And so I trained for that, competed for that. Uh, unfortunately, did not win the actual competition, but you know the experience was incredible. And ever since then, I was able to stay in touch with the foundation. And another one of their great things that they do is called the Mentor Grant Program. And it is an incredible program that, you know, you can apply and and submit some things. And if selected, they will basically send you to wherever you want in the world to stage for, you know, whatever period of time you select. And they help you with all of that. And so I was interested in that. So I applied for that and got selected for that again and uh, was able to go to the French Laundry for one month. That's incredible. First of all, I was riveted by what you were saying. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like a rocky that I could go from, you know, from Spain to Australia to, you know, in the States anywhere. And for me, you know, I've always uh, looked up to Chef Keller as an inspiration. Um, well, okay. Tell us about being at the French Laundry. Yeah. So, I mean, the French Laundry is, for me was, you know, I had so many places that I could pick from that, that I could go from, you know, from Spain to Australia to, you know, in the States anywhere. And for me, you know, I've always uh, looked up to Chef Keller as an inspiration and the French Laundry was just, it's, it's such an iconic restaurant, uh, as you said, and, and Napa Valley is so beautiful. And I knew that if I had this chance to go there, I, I had to take it. So, you know, so that's where I went. And, you know, getting out there, I was able to, you know, really see the restaurant as a whole. I was able to, I was there for, for one month and they were able to, you know, kind of shift me around through different stations of the restaurant starting with the the Comey team, which is, you know, the team of Comeys that basically do prep work projects for the chef de parties who work service every night. Uh, so I worked my first week with them. 
And then after that, I was able to move into the service team working both lunch services and dinner services, the French Laundry. What was one of the greatest takeaways? What I think Chef Keller, what he does so well is is instilling in his in his chefs and his cooks is, you know, how to properly run a kitchen and, you know, just having, you know, this constant sense of urgency and sense of ownership. You know, some of the best I've ever seen. But what I took away more was, you know, just what I think Chef Keller, what he does so well is is instilling in his in his chefs and his cooks is, you know, how to properly run a kitchen and, you know, just having, you know, this constant sense of urgency and sense of ownership and just respect for products and, you know, just really running a restaurant the right way and efficiency is, you know, things like that that aren't as tangible. Mm-hmm. But I think those were what's really stuck with me and I think will stick with me for the rest of my career. So when you say respect for ingredients or respect for products, what do you mean by that? I just, I mean, everything, everything that's done there is, is done with such a purpose, you know, just the way that produce when it's checked in in the morning and the way that it's, you know, put away and labeled and, and just little things like that from the moment that it comes in the door to the moment that a chef takes it out and processes it or cleans it or blanches it. Every single step is shown the same respect along the way, all the way up to the to where it meets the guest. And I think having that respect for food and, and not wasting things and, you know, there's just so much of that is, is you know, I think people don't realize that in a, in a restaurant like that, things like that are so important, but they really are and, and they make such a big difference. You know, you hit upon an interesting point, food waste. I have actually, I've tried to read on the subject a lot because I don't want to waste any part of food. I always tell my husband, unless it's putrefied, it can still be used. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as far as vegetables, I'm going to use it until it falls apart in my hands. It's going to get, it's going to go in a stew or something, something <laughs> it can be, it can be used. Uh, nothing like just really makes me angrier at myself than if I have a bunch of herbs that go to waste or if I, you know, let a vegetable or a carrot, you know, has not been utilized. Like, so I try yeah. really hard not to buy too much. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Because, you know, I, I walk into Whole Foods and I'm like, I want everything. I want all the herbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Like some people ball out of control at the mall. I ball out of control at Whole Foods. Like, <laughs> there's no ingredient too expensive that I won't buy. <laughs> But I, I'm always cognizant of I don't want to waste this ingredient because it's just a sh- it's just a shame. It's just to to me to to let your your ingredients go to waste. So I try really hard to figure out ways. Like I have a uh, some carrot tops right now in my fridge because I was like I bought carrots and I buy now I buy carrots with the tops because I want to use both the tops. I always use the tops as like garnish, yeah. um, but I don't waste anything. Yeah, mm, I mean, sorry. Or you know I haven't looked at it recently i need to refresh my memory on it but in you know the iconic french laundry cookbook chef keller speaks about you know this you know his immense respect for food and just talking about how you know a farmer spent his time growing that carrot or raising that rabbit or that lamb and and for you just to you know take it and ruin it or burn it or something that's you know you're wasting it it goes down this long line of, of people that that affects you know so just really being careful with how you cut things or cook things or or you know, do anything as to not waste. And it's, it's really important. Talk to me about your, the restaurant you're working at now. Okay. I've, there's this book on my coffee table and it talks about like the family meals that people make at restaurants. Yeah. Do you guys, you know, do you guys do that? What, because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a chef. I don't aspire to, to be a chef because uh, I know you guys live a hard life <laughs> and I'm too lazy, <laughs> but I'm going to support you all. <laughs> But I would love to be at a family meal like before the restaurant opens because I imagine that there's just some really amazing, crazy, delicious dishes that you're you're making. Talk to us about what's that like? Like what's the family meal like for you guys? And what are some of the things you guys have made there? Yeah. So I mean family meal is very, very important. You know, I've worked at a bunch of places where some places value it more than others and and some do not. You know, where I'm at now at Fish or Fowl, we we don't do family meal every day. Uh, we do it as often as we can, as time permits. But for us, it's usually pretty simple food, something fun. I mean, we do, you know, a lot of like casseroles and pasta dishes. Pasta is always very big. We have one of our cooks who likes to make corn dogs. So corn dog and French fry day is always fun. Uh, fried chicken day is always great. But it's really, it's just, it's food that, you know, we would not be serving on the menu. 
it's food that we you know just that we like to eat and that is you know that will fuel us and give us energy for for the night service and that's you know that's what family meal is for is just to be able to sit down for 10 15 minutes and and eat a meal and you know get ready for for the night service that sounds so fun i bet you you know like if you're like hey, three outsiders can come and sit at this meal and eat. I'd be like, I'm there. <laughs> um, so there. Like, <laughs> so you talk about like, you know, just eating things you like to eat. I want to talk to you for a moment about at home. Like you talked about you made a blog and yeah. ice, but what are those meals that you're making at home over and over that sustain you and your wife? To be honest, we don't cook at home as often as we would like. It's tough. You know, we, we both work a ton. so. The time that we do get off together, most nights we'll, you know, we'll go out to a friend's restaurant or, you know, just go get Chinese takeout or something because it's easy and we're both tired and we don't want to cook. But honestly, we'll cook breakfast at home. You know, we'll do eggs and my wife loves when I make eggs Benedict. So that's her probably her favorite thing to cook at home. But honestly, we, I mean, our kitchen at home is not used as much as it should be just because, you know, I, I cook so much at work and you know, sometimes it's just like on a day off, if we both have a night off together, it's like, we'll look at each other and we're like, yeah, let's just get, let's get takeout. It's easy. <laughs> See guys, even chefs are like, uh, where is Uber Eats? Oh, like, <laughs> yes, I love Uber Eats. It's so easy. I mean, <laughs> yes. I like that. You know, the fact that you're like, no, we're going to just get Chinese that you're just you're, it's not, you know, it's just, that's kind of like how your life is. And, and you're right. You're so busy and you're always cooking. The last thing you probably want to do is come home and make something for yourself. I think people think that when you're a chef, you're going home and you're making a six course meal, like, or I- yeah, a lot of people think that, but it's, it's the total opposite. I mean, it's just like, and you know, people get intimidated, you know, like cooking for me. And it's just like, I'm, totally fine with anything that I don't have to cook, which is great. Yes. I, same thing. I've had that problem. People are like, well, I don't, I don't want to make anything for you because I'm not that good of a, a cook. And I'm like, are you kidding? I don't care if we eat hot dogs. It's like you're making yeah. food for me. It's, it's not yeah. about the food. It's about the fellowship and the fact Absolutely. That we, yeah. We get to spend time together and you're doing something nice for me. I don't care. I don't care what we we make or what we eat. I'm not going to be like this is disgusting. I'm out. No, like yep. <laughs> I'm going to eat what you made. Absolutely, you made it for me. I, I think that's a problem. Anyone who does anything sort of in the culinary world, people are like, "Well, I can't make it as good as you." I'm like, "That's not the point. It's not." <laughs> yep. <laughs> the point is that you made something, and it's exactly. probably better than you think. Yeah, that's so. That's that's so. That's so fun that people are so intimidated. I don't, uh, don't be intimidated. Cook where you're at, like cook what you know and cook where you're at. Don't be not agree more. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I want to talk about the menu. So I've looked at this menu. I'm mad that I'm not in Pittsburgh because, oh my gosh, uh, the first thing you have on the menu, I want to talk about the restaurant menu. Yeah. Sourdough bread with pan drippings and cultured butter. You are speaking my language. Oh my God. <laughs> what kind of pan drippings are those? So it is quite a few things. So it's literally, we'll make like a, a pan gravy from basically a lot of the trim from some of the meats that we process in house. So it starts with foie gras, all of the trimmings from that. And then there is 40 day dry aged beef trimmings in there. And then mangalista pork trimmings in there. So it's Super, super rich. It's really, really good. It sounds amazing. I just made Allison Ramon's. Uh, she has a chicken, uh, baked chicken recipe, a roast okay. chicken excuse me, recipe, and it's got like anchovies on it and butter, which is like yes, <laughs> yeah. all day. And then she tells you in the recipe, right as you're finishing up, move, take the chicken out, and then in the pan that you cook the chicken, add a bunch of like you know uh, bread. Okay. Like chopped up bread so that it can absorb those yeah. drippings. Now you have these crusty, delicious, you know, kind of just, you know, savory croutons. I'm like, oh, I did it. So as soon as I saw <laughs> the sourdough bread, I'm like, yes, that is yeah, all I want. Great. Yeah, it just sounds so good. But I want you to tell me what are some of your favorite dishes on the menu at Fish Nor Fowl? And actually, what's the meaning behind the name Fish Nor Fowl too? So Fish Nor Fowl, it kind of, so our owners and our executive chef who are behind all of this, it kind of comes from, 
you know, an old saying of neither fish nor fowl, which means kind of something that cannot be classified. And that was kind of their theme with the restaurant was, you know, to kind of create a restaurant that could not be, you know, a lot of the, the other restaurants that are in, in the restaurant group are very distinct and very, you know, have a food focus and a cocktail focus that, that, that paired together. And with fish nor fowl, there, there really wasn't that definitive, you know, genre of, of what we are as a restaurant. And so that's kind of where the name comes from of we kind of, we don't really fit within a certain parameter. We kind of are creating our own. I like that. And what are some of your favorite dishes on the menu right now? Ooh, that's tough. I know. It's tough for me. I'm like, I'm, I want to eat it all. One of them would probably be the the lamb tongue. So mm-hmm. it's a comfy lamb tongue. So it's cooked very low and slow in, in oil until it gets super, super tender. And just it's, I mean, I like to me, it has like the texture of like a perfectly cooked pastrami. Uh, it's mm-hmm. so good. And then it's it's seared in a pan and glazed with a, with a demi-glace and pickled mustard seeds and sweet potatoes and smoked figs. And that dish is really good. It's super rich. What else? Uh, right now, there's a, we have a cassoulet on our menu, which cassoulet is like a super, super like old school traditional dish. Uh, and we do it for two people in this big, big cast iron. It comes out of the oven like super bubbly and the breadcrumbs are all toasty. And, and that one's really good, especially on a very, very cold Pittsburgh day like today. I would tell you that when I saw the cassoulet, that was the, that would have been, I, I'm a, so one, I'm a big fan of duck. Yeah. Anytime there's duck on the menu, I'm eating duck, but I would absolutely have ordered the cassoulet because it's hard to make cassoulet at home. Um, yeah. You can do it, but it takes forever. Um, so if a restaurant is willing to do it for me, I'm willing to eat it. Absolutely. That would be so delicious and yummy. Is there anything special that you do for your cassoulet? It's different than most. Uh, not really. I mean, it's just it's pretty pretty basic, pretty traditional, just done really well, pretty simple. Which I think that's what a cassoulet should be is it's simple, done well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds awesome. You're talking about the lamb tongue. Normally, like uh, you'll hear on another podcast, that I do finally just declared to the world, I don't like lamb. I feel <laughs> like it's, I just, I don't like it. There's two things that like, I feel like, like just take my street cred as a foodie down like two notches. One is I don't like goat cheese. And the second is I don't like lamb. And I want to, I want it to like those things because I feel like how can you possibly love the restaurant world <laughs> and love food and not like those two ingredients? But I, I can't, I just, I, I've tried so hard to like goat cheese and it's just something about the flavor. It just, I don't know. It's just a kink. I, I mean, everybody has their foods they don't like. I get it. Yeah. Is that? Do you have something that you don't like? I've got two foods that I really don't like, and people don't get it. It's uh, salmon and strawberries. <gasps> yeah. See. Wow. <laughs> I know. It's really strange. Salmon. Yeah. I live on salmon. <laughs> I, I, like, like, and I'll eat both of them. Like, it's not something like I I won't eat. It's just. I'll never order it by my own accord. I uh, definitely not my favorite. Wow. And strawberries. Yeah. That's a hot take. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah. That's, that's okay. All right. Well, I don't feel so bad. So you're good with it. lamb and goat cheese. You're good. Yeah. Lamb and goat cheese. They're just, just, they're just, I can't, I mean, I'll, I will also eat them. I just won't like, it's not going to be something I save where I'm just going to be like, all right, I'm eating this, yeah. you know, yep. like, yeah. <laughs> I'm eating this just to be full, but I'm not eating this because I really want it. But you're, the, lamb, I was, the reason I bring that up is because the lamb tongue, the way you make it sounds super good because yeah. everything else on it, I think like I would probably like that a little bit more than most lamb because I feel that the fact that you're comfy in it is probably taking away, you know, it's that real lamby flavor. See, I think that, that I think yeah. that you need to try, uh, there's the, so the land that we use, it comes from a farm actually in Pennsylvania. It's called uh, Elysian Fields Farm. And it's actually Chef Thomas Keller. He is a partner in this in this farm. And it is, to me, I mean, it's the best lamb in the world. And it does not eat like any other lamb. It does not have that gaminess. It, it just, it eats so clean. It changed my opinion on lamb, that's for sure. Okay, maybe that's why. Because yeah, lamb usually has that gamey flavor, and 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 that, you're used to, exactly. Yep. And what's weird is that I don't mind a gamey flavor in like a rabbit or like a pheasant sure. or like you know a deer because I'm I don't know. It's like I'll eat the heck out of like some venison, and that also but has like a little bit of a gamey yeah. flavor. So I'm not I'm not against eating game. It's just I don't know. There's just something about lamb, but okay. I'm going to, when I pass through Pittsburgh, stop the restaurant <laughs> and have the 
just because you said I won't be disappointed. So mm, it just sounds like the, so many things on the menu sound so good. Um, the pork schnitzel. It's so good. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Germany. So, you know, you better, like I do like schnitzel. I'm like, you better bring it. Like, <laughs> right. And then I notice every menu has like some type of roast chicken. What's up with that? Why do why does why does every restaurant have a roast chicken on it? Because it's the most perfect thing ever. I mean, I I love roast chicken. Everybody, I think, loves roast chicken. I think chicken is just. I mean, one chicken is probably the most accessible protein in America. At least um, that's what a lot of Americans default to when it comes to meats. Um, and two, you know, I just I think a roast chicken is when it's done right is. I prefer roast chicken over beef or pork or, you know, lamb or anything any day. But it's, you know, a perfect roast chicken. It's just it sounds so good right now. Doesn't that? Oh, my goodness, it does. I do love a roast chicken, especially like if it's it's like good and salty and you got some bread that you can dip into yeah. the dripping. Oh. Uh, there is nothing with potatoes inside. So good. So good. Man, I want a roast chicken tonight for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm here in Hawaii. And I'm, <laughs> There's no, we have no polar vortex here, but it's been colder than usual. Right now, everyone's like playing a violin, like, right. <laughs> I, I know, I know it's no polar vortex, but I definitely <laughs> lean. I made ragu the other night because okay. it was kind of chilly and I'm like, all right, I'm breaking out all my cold weather recipes. <laughs> 65 degrees here. <laughs> There's somebody screaming in their car right Absolutely. now, like, I'm stuck in a polar vortex i'm sorry you need to come to Hawaii. <laughs> okay so i want to i want to talk about if let's say i'm a cook who, who's not i'm a brand new cook i burn water i'm just trying to teach myself to learn to cook what's a meal that you can recommend that i the very first meal that i should learn to make i would say a uh, a classic french omelet it's not easy but i think it teaches simplicity which is important when you're when you're cooking. It also teaches patience because your first one is going to be horrible. Uh, your second one is going to be horrible. Your third one is going to be horrible. Uh, it takes a lot of just you know cooking a classic French omelet is is it's very simple. You have very few ingredients. You have eggs, maybe some butter. You have salt, and you have a nonstick pan, and that's it. So it's very little things. There's very little variables for failure, but failure happens. 99% of the time. But I think that it's a very special thing that when you're making these omelets, and I've seen it with many cooks of mine that I've had that, you know, we're working brunch, and they're screwing up every single omelet. And then eventually, it just clicks. And they finally understand what the heat should be. And they understand what their movements of their of their wrist should be and how the spatula should go. And I think that, you know, just when that light bulb goes off of, okay, now I get it, then that can translate to other things. So and I mean, French omelet is just delicious in general. So you get the positive of being able to eat it as well. But I think it really can teach you a lot of great lessons. In yeah, that's a great one. I still can't get a French omelet. <laughs> and I've been trying them for like three, three to four years now. And I'm still like, there. you know, I'm sure, it, I'm sure if you were there and you made me just cook a hundred French omelets, <laughs> like by, by 75, I maybe could get yeah, it down the pat, but. Yeah, but so, and eat, even eat your mistakes. Exactly. <laughs> you can eat your mistakes. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect before you eat it. Just keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Okay, so what is that one tip that you can give to a home cook out there who's been, that he or she's been listening to us or like, I'm on board, Ryan, like I'm ready to go. What's that tip that you can give them that they can use to make their meals more delicious? Well, I think for me, it's it's a few things. It's, I think, organization and, you know, what we say in restaurants, mise en place is, is so important, you know, having things in its place. I think a lot of people at home are, are intimidated by cooking at home because, you know, there's you know so many pots and pans and ingredients you have to cut and chop and measure and weigh and, and the dishes. So if you literally just, you know, if you think of it from a chef's perspective of how we do things in a restaurant of, you know, setting things up and having things weighed out and cut and in little containers. And then when it kind of comes time to, to cook things or, you know, to go ahead and, and, and start the process, it's so simple. And cooking is, is actually the easy part. You know, it's, it's the prep of, of getting there, which may take some time, but in the long run, it's so worth it. So I think that having that organization in a home kitchen is, it's huge. 
And I also think that, you know, seasoning and tasting as you go, uh, not just seasoning at the beginning of cooking and not just seasoning at the end of cooking, but tasting your food as it's cooking is important because flavors change. And, you know, I think that a lot of cooks at home don't season their food anywhere near enough that it should be. You know, I think learning how to season properly is important. And I mean, it takes time to learn that, but I think it really can elevate your, your home cooking. That sounds like a great tip. So season your food. Don't be afraid to taste it so you know that it's seasoned. I was talking to um, Sandy Axelrod and she was saying like, you know, you need to salt your food. You know, you just, you should be salting your food throughout uh, and people don't use enough salt. I think people are afraid of salt because they've heard all this, you know, you know, they've heard that, oh, salt's bad for you. And I maintain that you can't salt your food enough to make it bad for you at home. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I get it. People are afraid or or like it's, I've I've seen this before too with, with friends and family. If they're reading a recipe that they get from online, which is great. The internet is a great resource for so many recipes. If they don't see salt in a recipe, they don't add it. And and I've seen so many recipes online that don't call for for salt or, or anything. And, you know, it's just, you need to be able to look at a recipe and then, you know, kind of implement your own things. And, and salt is is something that should be in there, and then also be able to look at a recipe and and put your own twist on it, and, and use what you have. No, those are great tips. All right, Ryan, where can people find you? So Instagram, it's the best place. I'm very active on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at Ryan Peters P G H. That's R Y A N P E T E R S P G H on Instagram. You can also check out the restaurant on Instagram. It is at Fish Nor Fowl, and Fowl is F O W L P G H. So at Fish Nor Fowl P G H on Instagram as well. And yeah, Instagram is the best place to follow me. I love Instagram. I love being able to connect with with lots of people all over the world. So it's my it's my favorite resource. Awesome. And you're often like you're in the restaurant most nights cooking too, right? Every night I'm there. That's awesome. So someone can be like, I know that guy. I listen to him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Who is this person? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be like, excuse me. I, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know her. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> Who is this woman? No. <laughs> She's just ordering roast chicken after chicken. <laughs> well, I've had so much fun talking with you and I love the tips that you gave and I, I love the story that you gave us. And I think it's going to really help a lot of people decide, you know, what, what they should be doing in the culinary world. So thank you, Ryan, for being on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you. This was great. All right. I hope I get out. Pits- if I'm coming to Pittsburgh, I'm coming to see you. So <laughs> sounds good. I look forward to it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you've just finished hearing me have a delightful chat with Ryan Peters, the sous chef at Fish Nor Fowl. Ryan was amazing to chat with. You know I love chatting with chefs because they always have some amazing tip that you wouldn't think about. And let's admit it, while many of us dream about becoming chefs ourselves, the fact is that Ryan works incredibly hard, long hours, and it shows. I think we, you know, listening to him and, you know, how hard he worked to get to where he is today including owning his own restaurant. It's just insane, but really inspiring. You know, just look at his Instagram, like 99% of the pics that I see him post there are inside of the restaurant because it's pretty much a fact that he's always there. But still, despite all of that hard work, you know, I really believe Ryan was meant to be a chef. I just can't get over that adorable idea in my mind of him playing restaurant in his house with his mom as a little kid. I mean, how cute is that? It's so cute. Anyway. Ryan mentioned some organizations like the James Beard Foundation and the Bocuse de Or. I hope I said that right. I'll link to those in the show notes and, of course, to the restaurant where Ryan works in Pittsburgh. And, yes, he would love it if some of you guys showed up for dinner because, duh, chefs love to feed people. And I'm sure he'd be thrilled to know that someone was listening to his interview and decided to go to dinner because they were intrigued and thought, man, this guy probably cooks really good food. And I bet you he does. And I can tell you, if I get to Pittsburgh, I'm going to eat there. So, and I will absolutely Instagram that whole thing. Anyway, I also wrote out his recipe that he said in the beginning for what he made for himself, a ragu, because that sounded so dang good. And I just couldn't resist writing it down. 
And I bet you there are other people like, wait, 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 they're just going back and, and trying to re-listen so they can also make that ragu. It sounds delicious. So this is the first episode since February. You know, I thought originally I was going to just be out for two weeks. And of course, that turned in a month and a half, which is like 20 years in podcast land and social media time. And hence, that's why you're hearing me talk about the polar vortex with Ryan, because I recorded this a couple of weeks ago back when I was healthy and I uh, thought I was going to put it out within uh, several weeks. But I want to thank everyone for their support and just the time to allow me to heal. I was really sick for a while. Um, so sick, in fact, that I could barely eat anything at all. For the first time in like forever, I wasn't interested in food. And I was kind of depressed about that because I was like, can you even be a food blogger without like being interested or loving food. I kept thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I've lost my identity and <laughs> I was just sick. I'm so dramatic. Anyway, I'm happy to say that my appetite is slowly returning. I am on the mend and hopefully I'll just keep getting better and better. And I just want to say thank you again to everyone who reached out to me and checked in on me. It meant a lot and I totally appreciate it. So yes, season two is continuing. The podcast is not stopping. I'm a one a woman show basically. So if I go down, the show goes down for a while. But hey, you know, that's how most podcasts are. I mean, I'm not like on a podcast network or I don't have any huge sponsors or anything. I'm just one girl out here loving food and wanting to talk to other people who love food and who are interested in it and who love taking pictures of it. So yeah, and I appreciate your support if you're listening to the show. In fact, uh, if you like the show, you can uh, go give us a review. That'd really be amazing. Or you can just tell somebody who, you know, who also loves food, who also obsesses about buttermilk pancakes like I do. Point them in the direction of the show. Would love to hear if you like it. And uh, we have a Facebook group I post in there. My thoughts and musings about the show and after the fact And anyone's welcome to join. So yeah, there's always links to that in the show notes as well. So look, until next time, this is BFF with the Chef, wishing you a great week and hoping you've been inspired to go and make something delicious. Goodbye. Goodbye.